We are going to sing one of Cleo's favorite hymns today, Be Thou My Vision, number 451 in the hymnal. We read in the Gospels that uh, where two or three are gathered in my name, Jesus says that God is with us. I think we forget. We get so busy. You know, we're all worked up in our lives and trying to make things happen that we forget how much power there is in what we're doing right now. Coming together to acknowledge that God is our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. There's great power and what we're about today. And we thank you that you've made worship a priority and that you're here. And we want to welcome everyone and celebrate your presence. And we do that through our Hey Card. And it looks like this. If you're here in person, we invite you to fill this out. If you're new, maybe give us some contact info. It's so helpful. Maybe you've already done so, but it's helpful if you do it again. It saves me a step or two. Because we take these cards and we pray for you by name. And if we don't know you that well and you're visiting our church, we, we use this as a resource to connect with you and get to know you. So I hope you will fill this out. Some of you may prefer to do it electronically. We have a QR code on the back of our pew. We invite you to go there. Or if you're online or worshiping through our televised broadcast, we would invite you to go to our website and connect with us in that way. We, we look at the digital hay card. That's what we call it every single week. So we, we hope you will take this step and connect with us. A big part of worship is also being generous, giving back to God with our resources, our gifts, our talents, our time. And so we want to thank you for being so generous with this church and giving in all the ways that we um, provide. And we thank you, thank you so much for all that you do and all the ways that you show up for this congregation. Let's pray together. Oh God, use these gifts that we share today and all that we offer, all of ourselves, and bring glory. May, may it, what we do and what we bring, may it bring glory and honor to your name and to your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Please be seated. Oh, um, please remain standing. You know, I, what can I say? I always forget that. Please join me as we affirm our faith in the risen Christ. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. This morning, we have the honor of celebrating the sacrament of holy baptism. And as we prepare to do that, I want to invite Maddox and his sister Natalie Jackson to come forward with their parents. So um, you probably could figure this out, that Maddox and Natalie are brother and sister. <laughs> About a year ago, is that when y'all joined? Not quite a year, but almost. I remember going to Lauren and Avery's home, and we visited... And at that time, we were talking about them joining. And, uh, of course, Avery and, and Lauren have already been baptized, and they grew up in the church and have been faithful to it. And we were talking about bringing their children up in the church and what a gift and honor that is and important responsibility. And Maddox, I believe you asked me that day about baptism. We talked about it. We had a conversation, you remember? It's okay. Well, I remember it. That's the way I'm going to tell the story anyway. We talked about baptism. And, um, you know, so Maddox goes to a Catholic school, and he's really, or do you both go to the same school? Yep. And, and, and you've picked up on some things, and you've been paying attention, and I thought that's how we were talking about baptism. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> baptism is so important, and I do know you asked this question because I was at your house a week ago, and Maddox asked me, when you baptized me, you remember this? What, what did you ask? If, you, if I was going to hold you up like I hold up the baby. <laughs> you did ask that question, didn't you? Okay. <laughs> so, I'm not. You can see in the bulletin that Maddox is eight, Natalie, his little sister, is six, and though they haven't reached the age of confirmation when they will answer these questions for themselves in a formal way and confirm their baptism, that you are old enough to begin to know that I'm not the one that holds up your life anyway. And even as your parents help you and your family helps you, it's ultimately, this is what baptism's about, the one who holds you up and sustains you is God. And that's what our baptism reminds us, no matter what age or stage, that as we go about this world, our true sustainer is God and God alone. And so, as we prepare to baptize you so that you don't ever forget that, I'm going to ask your parents, as we anticipate your confirmation, these questions. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin as parents on behalf of the children? Will you say, I do? I do. Great. Or we do, whichever one, yeah. Do you accept the freedom and power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say, we do. We do. And this, to me, is the most important question. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in God's grace, and promise to serve the Lord in union with the church that Christ has opened up to everyone? If so, say, we will. And will you nurture, by the help of God and the help of the church, will you nurture Maddox and Natalie so that one day when they're old enough, they can confess for themselves and confirm their own baptism in and through Jesus Christ? If so, say, we will. We will. Okay. All right, Maddox. I'm not going to hold you up. I'm going to ask you to kneel right here. 
And if you'll extend a hand and um, just conjure up all the love that you can muster. And y'all put your hands on him. Maddox Avery Jackson, we baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And may the Spirit work within you that you may always be a faithful child and servant and disciple of Jesus Christ. And everyone says, Amen. 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 All right. You can clap for him. Stand up tall here. So y'all can all see Maddox. <laughs> so little sister Natalie, if you want to place your hands, if you'll kneel, Natalie. Natalie, Elise. Okay, you ready? If everyone hold out their hands just like you're doing. Ready? Natalie Elise Jackson, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And may you be a faithful servant and child and disciple of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. Okay, Natalie, do you want to stand up so everyone can see you? Hold your applause. Okay. Stand right here and face everyone. Natalie. <laughs> And just so everyone can see, do y'all mind walk, walking with me hand in hand? Because we're in this together. Can we just, can you play a little tune for us, James? We're going to walk around just so everyone can bless you. Y'all walk a little faster. <laughs> These are the newest members of our church. They are sealed in the Holy Spirit, children of God. We're going to walk around this way. Follow my lead here. All right. And here's what I'm counting on from you. Every time you see them, call them by name, stoop down, get on their level, smile, and tell them over and over, it cannot be said enough, how much God loves them. And they're, they're not alone. And we're in this together. Okay, you ready to go back to your parents? Okay, let's go. And I know after the service is over, you're not going to race to your lunch. You're going to come down here and greet these great people. So, bless you. Grace and peace be with you, and also with you. Will you pray with me? Oh, gracious and loving God, what a beautiful Sunday you have given us once again. And as I stand here in this beautiful sanctuary, feeling the presence of your Holy Spirit within it, surrounding us as only you can do best with your love and your peace. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And may we constantly be reminded of your presence in our lives and forgive us and we take it for granted. Be with all of those affected by this Hurricane Helene. We have experienced that before. And we pray for comfort and strength for all. As they begin to rebuild their lives, 
Lord, I remember the rumbles of that storm. I remember what it looked like around our church. And we were fortunate. May others be as fortunate as we were that day when I came and looked at the church again, safe. Thank you, Lord. And thank you, Lord, for what you've given me in my life. All these many years here among this wonderful church family. Our, my prayers will always be with them. I pray for the leadership for Jill and for my Claire. All will be well, and they will lead this church on with its missions, its outreaches, and the love they have for each other and for our community and the world. You've given me and my family much through all the years with this church. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Be with those that are on our prayer list. Give them healing mercies and be with those that remain in our hearts, those prayers that we cannot even say out loud, that we keep to ourselves. And may we do what we do best, reach out to the least, never forgetting there is someone in this world that is lonely, that is sick, and most of all, that are grieving the death of a loved one our dear friend. I pray for my new church, the church at the barn, and I'm asking for everyone to pray with me for this wonderful, wonderful opportunity I've been given. This wonderful surprise. It humbles me, Lord, that you trust in me to lead this congregation on, that I can be one of your kingdom builders. As we go out, as we have every Sunday, may we go with peace and love in our hearts. And now may we be so bold to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, how will be thy name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, church. It's time for some more music. If you could please stand if you're able. We're going to sing King of My Heart. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are her good, good, oh, you are her good, good, oh, you are good. the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails the anchor in the waves oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the fire in my vein the echo of my day oh he is my song he are
never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. The scripture reader this reading this morning is from the book of Genesis, chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words, and as they migrated from the east, they came upon a, plant, a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its tops in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall, shall, we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which mortals had built. And the Lord said, Look, they are one people, and they all have one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there, so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Margaret Powell, for reading our scripture. Appreciate your prayer, Cleo. And wow, our choir, fantastic job. Deanna, I knew you could sing. I knew you could play the recorder. But boy, you can surely play the clarinet. Beautiful job. Margaret, who read our scripture, grew up in this church. And she's not the only one. We have several people in this congregation who have grown up in this church. They went off, they lived their lives, they got married maybe, came back, and they're here. Now that's saying a lot for a congregation when you grew up in it and you want to come back. So I just want us to give a hand for all those that came back and are part of this church. You're such a blessing, and we are very, very grateful. Let's pray together. Come. Come, Holy Spirit, come in the way that only you can come and illuminate our hearts and minds with your wisdom and truth so that we can go out in the world and be better equipped to be your agents of healing in a hurting world. And now, may the words of my mouth, but also the meditations and reflections of all our hearts, may they be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So today is the last day... This is the last day of a sermon series for the month of September that we've held around here 
on the first book of the Bible, and that is the book of Genesis. In particular, we have focused on the first 11 chapters in Genesis. And um, I've called this series, what? In the beginning. In the beginning, because these first 11 chapters, um, in the beginning, I think means, I think what the sacred writers were saying was that in the beginning stands for time before time. And what I mean that by that is time before we understand time as we know it today. And so I mentioned this earlier in one of my sermons on this series. We're not looking to these 11 chapters for scientific understanding. We're not looking for historical accuracy and, and facts here. We're looking for the lessons to be gleaned. And, and I believe that there are lessons, there's a truth, there's a wisdom that transcends all of time in these stories found in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Truth that um, transcends time. It, and so it doesn't matter, you know, what age or stage you're in or what generation. The, the same truths are to be understood today. They're just as relevant today as they would have been thousands and thousands of years ago. So just a quick recap here. In the first 11 chapters of Genesis, we've looked at the creation stories, plural, because there's more than one. The next Sunday, we looked at Adam and Eve and that long and complicated story that goes on and on in the garden. Then we looked at Cain and Abel. Last week, we looked to Noah and the story of the flood and the ark. And today, we're ending these these um, in the beginning stories, these origin stories, with the story of the Tower of Babel. Now, some people pronounce it Babel. I'm going to say Babel because that's what I grew up hearing. Now, Babel in Hebrew, I think it's important for you to know this, means confusion. Now, so you'll internalize that. Say that word with me. Confusion. What does Babel mean in Hebrew? Confusion. Good. And the story goes like this. There was a town called Confusion, a town called Babel. And in this town, some people came together and they said, let's build a tower and let's make some bricks and let's bake them extra thoroughly so they'll be strong. Let's build a tower so high that it reaches the skies. Translation we read today, reaches the what? Heavens. And that's how the story goes. And ever since that time, time before time, in the beginning, we've been building towers ever since. In the United States, many of you know this, the United States has not the tallest, but some of the tallest buildings in the world. According to my Google research this week, the tallest, currently the tallest building in the United States stands in Lower Manhattan, the One World Trade Center. After the attacks on 9-11, this structure was rebuilt. It was rebuilt. It was finally completed and opened for the very first time in, I looked it up, November of 2014. Now, the One World Trade Center, this is intentional. If we can put that slide up one more time. It's 1,776 feet tall, and that's a deliberate reference reference and salute to the signing of our country's Declaration of Independence. Now, this past June, I was reading, you know, trying to read about towers, and I was reading a news article that said in June of this year, the Oklahoma City Council gave the green light. Now, we know in the 90s, I think it was 95, there was another senseless attack on this city in a building. And so the council has given the green light for um, the, the building of the Legend Tower. Now, this is significant because if it is built, it will be the tallest tower in the United States. Now, it's not been built yet, but its projected height is 1,907 feet. But again, 
the United States doesn't have the tallest building in the world. This one, the tallest building in the world stands in Dubai, and it's 2,716 and a half feet. Now, that's pretty tall. More than 160 stories high. Now, I, got, I was interested. What in the world is going on in that building? <laughs> you know, what do they use that building for? So here's what an article said. In this building, we have a hotel, luxury housing, and other commercial properties. It also houses a state-of-the-art health and wellness facility and other um, restaurants and entertainment and hospitality venues. When it comes to tall buildings, it seems that still to this day, the skies are the limit. Now, some of you know Joseph Campbell. He was a mythologist, no longer living. But in the, in the 80s and 90s, he had this great work called The Power of Myth. And in this great work, he points out that if you want to see what a society believes in and values, then look at their tallest buildings and look at what they're dedicated to. And then he goes on. He says, in the Middle Ages, the tallest buildings were what? Can you guess? Churches and cathedrals, exactly. And then fast forward to around the 18th century, and the tallest buildings became more political. So let's say the city or a nation's capital would have been the largest. Fast forward to when Joseph Campbell lived in the modern era, and the tallest buildings were economic structures. And now, according to what I read, today the tallest buildings tend to have things like luxury housing and hotels and entertainment and hospitality and wellness centers. Campbell says that you can study history, the history of Western civilization, by its buildings. But let's get back to the Tower of Babel. In the beginning, in the beginning, when time was before time as we know it, you might even interpret it this way. In the beginning, when all was right with the world, a group of people in this town or this city wanted to build a tower, and they used the best technology available to them at the time. And that would have been something like this, a brick. And they had some kind of special slime that was sticky and held the brick together, and they burned them in a special way. And today I was thinking about what is a contemporary modern-day brick, and I think it would be these, you know, the iPad and the iPhone. These are our postmodern-day bricks. But the technology is not the what, it's the why. It's not what we do with technology. I use it like many of you do every single day. I can imagine my job without Google or Apple. Not to advertise, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> what we do with technology, to me, is not as important as the why. And so when we think about this in the beginning origin story before time was, or when time was marked by everything being right with the world, what begins to happen with this group of people where it goes wrong is not with the what, I don't think it was about the bricks. It was, it was the why. And we, we learn about their motivation in, the very, in this very verse where it says, let's build a tower as high as the heavens so that we can make what? Do we have this? So that we can make what? A name for who? Ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Today's story is rather short. We're in the 11th chapter, by the way. And this story is rather short, but we're already almost halfway through it. So that means we're halfway into this building project. And these people have, there's been zero, there's been no mention of who? God. Ding, ding, ding. Right answer. There's been no mention of God. I mean, they're busy. They're at, the, at work. They're building that tower up, 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 up into the skies. And there has yet to be even 
the name of God mentioned. Who do they mention? Themselves. Let's build a tower as high as the sky so that we can make a name for, not God, but ourselves. Let's talk about sin for a minute because all these stories about fall and sin. I mean, that's the favorite topic of, the, of a United Methodist, sin, right? What is it? Well, we have treated sin like a brick. I mean, we have pounded people with that word in the church and made them about, feel about as low as you can go. And shame on us for doing that. The original understanding of the word sin in the Hebrew, dirty brick, is an archery term that means to miss the mark. Miss the mark. And theologians, a lot older and wiser than I am, have said over and over throughout history that sin is, is, is turning in upon ourselves. It's not the what. It could be love. It could be kindness. It could be ambition, which is a good thing. But when it's turned wrong, we miss the mark. You get it? When we turn it on ourselves... It, we begin to miss, miss the mark. You see, these people don't even call on God. They don't even name God. But they also don't seek God's direction. You know, they're in the middle of this building project. You think they're turning to God for guidance or direction? No, because if they were, they would have done this. They would have remembered Genesis, the first chapter, and how God at creation, gives humankind a purpose. God's intent, God's will for humankind is what? Anybody remember? It's a familiar passage. Be fruitful and multiply. Now, I am a single woman, never married, don't have children. And I just want you to hear a different interpretation. This doesn't simply mean to propagate, to to have children. I think being a parent is the highest calling and probably the hardest in the world, and I have a deep respect for parents and grandparents and people who are parenting children. But being fruitful and multiplying is not limited to birth, giving physical birth. It's taking the gifts that God has given us, the talents, the resources, and using them for God's glory to promote a more just and merciful and kind world. And so, we've all been given a purpose. God's will for our lives is to be fruitful and to multiply and to fill the earth. Scatter, in other words. And what these people are doing in building a tower is just the opposite. It's self-preservation at all costs. I mean, it's got a big fence around it probably, though there's no mention of a fence. I just imagine that. And they're building it all about themselves. It's all unto them. And this is exactly the opposite of God's will for us, to, to be scattered, to be fruitful and multiply, and to fill, fill the earth. So what's happening here is a spiritual misalignment. Physical, going great, up, up, and up. I mean, the technology is wonderful. I mean, I think it was a probably very impressive tower. So the physical alignment is not the problem. It's a spiritual misalignment. You see, we think we can fix the world by turning to that which is external, but it's within. Okay, so, so there's a spiritual misalignment going on here. And what they have done, the reason they're missing the mark and the reason they're misaligned is because they have forgotten to put God in their decision-making process. Now, I suspect there's some people here today. Maybe you're here in person. Maybe you're tuning in through our Delay to Week televised broadcast or online. Whenever, however, we're grateful. But I suspect some of us here tuning in and gathered, some of us have some decisions that are happening in our lives right now. Maybe you are deciding if or when you're going to retire. Maybe you're thinking about starting a brand new ministry. 
Maybe you're trying to decide whether you want to build a family. Maybe you're trying to figure out, you've got an aging parent and you're trying to figure out how to offer the best care or a, an aging loved one. But I suspect that we have things going on in our lives and we're doing good work. I know you are because I'm one of your pastors and I know how good you are. And you're going about good things. But the question for us today is are we asking, is God part of our decision-making process? Are we turning to God regularly and daily asking for God's direction and guidance? And are we doing it just to make a name for ourselves? And we preachers tend to do this. Just grow this church so I can be the best pastor, you know. I'll get all the glory. Are we growing? Are we going about our work so that it can bring a good name for ourselves? Or is it about giving all the glory to God? Let's build a tower. Again, I think it was an impressive tower. I really don't know. wasn't there. This is time before time. But I can imagine it was tall and stately and pretty impressive. But there are two things wrong with it. It's about making a name for themselves, A. And B, it's also about people trying to secure their own futures. That's the problem with the tower. It's not the what. It's, it's not the technology. It's the why behind it. They think it's an impressive tower. But is it, and I'm sure it is, like I said, I'm sure it's impressive on earthly standards, but I wonder how impressed God was, you know, in light of all of eternity. I don't think God's all that impressed because I don't even think it, 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 it registers with God. And the reason I believe that is because what the scripture says is that God did what? Do you know? Came down. Now, they thought that tower was so high and impressive, and God can't even see it. So God has to come down. And the scripture says, God came down to look over the city and the tower that the people had built. And then God took one look, and then he garbled their speech. That's the translation I like. But our translation says what? What does Babel mean? Confused. So God took one look at the tower, at the city, at the people, and God confused them. And the way that God confused them is they all began to speak what? Different, Different languages. languages. And then it says God scattered them. Now, growing up, I heard this story, and I was always, it was always presented to me that that was their punishment. Makes sense. You know, they're not turning to God, so God would punish them. But as I read this in a deeper way, and with some of the resources that some of you have shared with me, I tend to believe that this is, that God came down, and in God's way, which is consistent through all of Scripture, this is a, what God does with the languages is not a punishment. It is an act of mercy. And here's why I think it's an act of mercy. God takes all that power, instead of concentrating it in one place and letting it go amok, God distributes the power, scatters it. And in so doing, God invites us to communicate with one another in a way that transcends language. And that is in and through the Spirit of God. And Paul writes that the language of the Spirit is love and joy, peace and patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and your, your favorite one, ready? Self-control. And the greatest, in another letter of his, Paul says, the greatest of these is love. So fast forward now to the New Testament. We're in John's Gospel. In that very familiar passage, Mark quoted it last week. For God so what? Loved. For God so loved the world. And what does the world mean here? Does it mean just one group of people? 
It means the whole world. In fact, it means all of creation. For God so loved the world, all that God had made, that God sent God's Son into the world, and whoever trusts in Him will not perish, but will have life everlasting. I want you to consider with me, as I begin to bring this home, I want you to consider with me the language of Jesus and how Jesus speaks. The Gospels tell us that when Jesus preaches and teaches, he doesn't preach like all the other teachers and religious scribes and scholars and and rabbis and such. There's something unique about Jesus in the way he speaks. We are told in the Gospels that Jesus speaks with a kind of what? Authority. You're supposed to know these things. Jesus speaks with a kind of power. In other words, when he speaks, that's right, James, when he speaks, people listen. Now, Ron Rollheiser, in his essays, he has a website, and you can look up all these essays. He writes several a year. In many of those essays, he talks about these three kinds of power, okay, different kinds of power that you can read about in Scripture, and we can experience it. We do in the world. One kind of power comes from strength and energy. It's like an athlete. It just flows from from energy. And and by the way, I decided today to steer away from football illustrations. (laughs) But this is the kind of energy. It comes from, from power. It comes from energy and strength. Now, there's another kind of power. I think we can agree on this image. I mean, who out there doesn't like um, Dolly Parton? So there's another kind of power that comes from charisma. And this is just like a musical star, country star, rock star. There's just a way about them that's just, you just gravitate to it. So this is another kind of power. And then Ron Rollheiser talks about a power that in the Scripture, in the Bible, especially in the Gospels, he calls it a paradoxical kind of power. And it comes, it's born out of vulnerability, and it's the power of a newborn infant. Now, which is more powerful? Which one of these kinds of power has the ability to transform hearts, but also transform the world? God came down in and through Jesus Christ. And when I think about the way he spoke and the way he lived his life while on this earth. What made him unique? One of a kind, super special, so that the world, even to this day, we are calling upon his name and following him. We're here today because of his life, his life, death, and resurrection. Why? What gave him this kind of transforming power and authority? Was it his humility? Probably. Was it his compassion, his mercy, his forgiveness? Yes, all of that. But I really don't think fundamentally it was about the what as much as it was about the why. What motivated Jesus to welcome the unwelcomed, to endure people's criticism again and again, to let people mock them, to to love them in spite of the way that they treated him? What motivated Jesus to hang out with the dregs of this world and to touch the untouchable? And what motivated Jesus to endure the worst and cruelest and most inhumane punishment ever, the cross? which led to the resurrection. I think what motivated him 
motivated him is he never forgot the source. The source, not just of his life, but of all that exists. God, God, God. So be it, and so it is. The invitation that we offer every single Sunday at this church is to, to join us. You know, you can't be a Christian by yourself. It's too hard. You need the help of the Holy Spirit, and you need the help of community. And we're not perfect, but we would love to be a part of your family as we all seek to grow in God's grace. And, and so as we're singing this song, I'm going to invite you to, do, to come forward if you want to join the church, but come stand close to me because I don't want to get you confused from other people because I'm going to ask you all to do something unconventional today to save time because we only got about two minutes before 11. I want you to come down, and Cleo and I are going to be right here with Jill, and, and uh, I'm going to ask uh, Maddox and um, Natalie and his fam- their family to be here too. But we're going to have a prayer for Cleo. So as we're singing this song, just just come on down and be close enough so that someone can place their hands on Cleo and that we can place our hands on each other. Can y'all do that for me? Hey, can y'all do that? All right. What is our song today, James? Glorious Day. All right, Glorious Day. As we're singing, come forward and let's surround Cleo with our love. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not All my failures I try to hide It was my truth Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave
So this is such a wonderful teaching moment. I want you to take a moment and just look around. And especially Natalie and Maddox, look at this, because when you think of church, this is what it looks like. It's just showing up for one another, like Cleo has shown up for us. So let's pray for her. Cleo, go with God. And as you feel the weight of our hands upon you, may you always know that God's good hand is upon you. May you always make it about people, loving God and neighbor, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And now to all gathered here, hear these words of blessing and benediction. Remembering that life is short. We do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be swift to love, make haste to be kind, and may the love of God, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all.